Hi, I'm John Moore. Today I'd like to talk about loading the fiberglass into the tool and what's critical. You know, the things that we're going to look at are the types of fiber and then how to decide. Obviously the fiber is giving us the greatest amount of strength in the overall performance of the composite. Yet the loading of the fiber into the mold is most critical to the process and the ability to control the resin flow path. So when we're deciding on a fiber, uh, we, we have to know what's out there, what's available to us. Well, let's first discuss what's important when we're considering it. Obviously, the overall strength. So we're having to concern ourselves with the final product. How much fiber content is there? Some are considering it by volume, others by weight percentage of the total laminate. But when we're thinking about the actual molding process, what we're most concerned with there is that the fiber fit uniformly, cross-sectionally. The thickness of the part, the mold cavity, has to be filled from the one surface to the top surface. So what I'm showing you here is a cross-section of a part. In fact, it's the same part we'll show as the discussion on loading. We want that fiber to fit uniformly in that cross-section. So here is then where we look at the different materials. Well, the first thought would be a woven fabric because that would give us the greatest strength. However, it is the least desirable for conformability. If we think about trying to conform a, a woven fabric, you know, if we tuck it in here, it's pulling there, and, and vice versa. It's a very difficult product to form. The other issue is there's no loft. So we would have to, if this were the material of choice, we would have to design into the calibration of the mold for the part thickness wherever there is an overlap, wherever we had to come down and dart and cut and fit over the top, well then the mold has to be sympathetic to that because the laminate must, as I say, be uniform in uh, thickness in respect to the fiber. So if the fiber has to overlap, then the mold is going to have to complement where that overlap is and that overlap will have to be in the same place each time. That is the disadvantage to a rigid second half of the mold Unlike if we had a bag, a nylon bag, silicon bag, whatever, for the vacuum infusion process, there is the one advantage it has. Wherever that overlap falls, it doesn't matter in the next one if it was slightly different. So uh, a woven fabric we would put in, but we put it in selectively, and we would have to have it in combination with something that's got fluff or loft to it. The uh, history was that we originally only had continuous strand mat. Does not stretch? in either direction. It's a continuous filament. We, For years this is all we had. Now it does have loft and so if it had an overlap it tends to be tolerant of that when we're molding and we're having a uniform cross-section in the mold calibration. But we were faced in those days with having to fit it as best we can but then dart and cut and have those overlaps fall into play as well as holding it in place. In the mid-90s there came about with some materials uh, that had a sandwich construction. It would be difficult for you to see, but they're chop. There is a, a core in the middle and then chop on the bottom. And then this is stitched together. The beauty of it is it stretches. It takes shape and holds that shape. Memory. Now, they come in two varieties. One is glass woven in the center. It's a, a knit all to itself. In fact, let me get a piece of that knit fabric center. So here we are is what's in the center of the glass type, when you have a glass core, is a, a, a knitted uh, fabric of this type, stretches in each direction very nicely, and then this has chop applied to it, top and bottom, and then stitched, and you end up with a, a product like this. That's also the same type of product where you have chop, you have a felt, a polyethylene, typically a polyethylene felt, and then more chop, and it too is stitched as a sandwich. For fire retardant applications, it's generally respectful to use the, uh, the glass core and the chop on each side. The beauty of these types of products is the ability to form. So when we're loading, it's critical that the glass take the shape and hold it in the, in the final product. We're looking for that glass to be complementary to the shape. Fill the cavity up in all areas. So what I had here, just to speed this operation up, here I've taken that sandwiched glass and I've shaped it. Now right away you're saying, well where do I get a preform like that? There are ways to make preforms. This was done just for this demonstration with 
having sprayed a coating on the surface of the mold so it would hold it in shape. What I'm trying to illustrate is the fact that these formable materials take the exact shape of the mold. And that is what's critical. It's also, what you can't appreciate in the video, it's thick just as the part thickness is. Going back to the part, the fiber is the same width or greater than the part thickness. So when the mold closes, we've got glass touching both sides of the mold, and the resin then is flowing with a bit of controlled resistance. And that is the key to the process. Having the ability to predict the resin flow resistance at the leading edge, and that will enforce the air ahead of it out towards the vent. It's when the resin has the ability to scoot up a, a radius because there's glass pulled tight to the inside against the male side, then it'll racetrack down that radius, that's when you'll entrap air or have dry spots in the part. So in summary, when selecting a fiber, we're going to base it on how the fiber content must be. We may be restricted to areas that need additional strength. We'll put in some woven fabrics for that strength uh, selectively. But ideally, we want a type of fiber that has loft and it has conformability. So that's how you decide.